Yeah, so my dad's a doctor, and my grandfather's a doctor, and my brother's a doctor, and my uncle's a doctor, and my mom was a respiratory therapist, and I've got a lot of nurses in the family. So, you know, we have a very strong tradition of medicine, and for a while I, uh, for a while I wanted to get into medicine, and I, I did everything you were supposed to do, you know, I became an EMT, and got ready for the MCAT and these types of things. But I, what I, the problem with being a physician is that you can only, over your course of your career, take care of you know, some maximal threshold of people. My grandfather delivered about 4,000 kids, give or take, and you know, he saved a lot of lives, but maybe it's 5,000, maybe it's 10,000, but that's your career. And being an entrepreneur is so great, and I went into mathematics first, but then I pivoted from there to being an entrepreneur because in essence, what you can do is you can build systems that influence the lives of millions, to potentially billions of people. And if you do it right, not, you're not just going to solve a particular problem. You're going to change the entire arc of their life. There's no greater example of that than I'd say recently than when I was in Tokyo and I was on the subway. And every single person in the subway had a cell phone, a smartphone, and they were looking at their smartphone. And this is a packed Japanese subway. And if you think about Steve Jobs, you know, he creates the iPhone, he creates this new paradigm for mobile computing and a, a view of how the human being should react. And, and it was so powerful and pervasive that that Japanese subway car is drinking his Kool-Aid as it is here in Thailand, as it is in Vietnam, as it is in Africa. I've been to over 50 countries in the last five years. Everywhere people have smartphones and they're using that paradigm. So he changed the world. And as an entrepreneur, you actually have the ability to do that. Now, if you do it with the right principles and you do it with the right philosophy and you do it with the right checks and balances, you don't change it for the better for yourself. You change it for the better for everybody. You make the world more fair. You make the world more equitable. And things just end up being better. Uh, so that's my goal. And I'd like to participate in, in at some small fashion there. And I think that's much more meaningful than medicine. A lot of people start in this industry with anger. You know, we were on the back of the 2008 financial crisis, and uh, I, I remember that that whole setup. You know, uh, it happens. Obama gets elected. We say, "Wow, there's a supermajority in the Senate and the Congress," and now we have a new guy who's not connected to the past. Uh, a lot of people are going to go to jail. Like we're going to see real changes in the industry. We're going to have a detailed discussion about the nature of the Federal Reserve System and its lack of transparency. And there was just a huge amount of excitement. We even saw the Occupy Wall Street movement. And the net result was no one went to jail. All the people who caused the crisis got hundreds of millions of dollars and got to retire with honors. Uh, and business as usual continued. And also the world printed trillions of dollars of new money to try to compensate for the crisis. And we put ourselves on an even more unstable foundation that if there was another global uh, crisis, it would be 10 times worse than the 2008 crisis. So a lot of us enter the cryptocurrency space as a kind of a reactionary force to say we're disgusted with the way things are this fractional banking thing and this, this, this whole Federal Reserve thing and this whole global market thing where a small group of people can cause this cascading wave of failure that can destroy everybody's lives. We need something different. Uh, so that was how we started, usually. You're either there or you're in the cypherpunk movement. And that, I'm not old enough for the cypherpunk movement. Those guys started in the 1980s and 90s. So those are the David Choms and the Hal Finneys. Uh, and so I, I came from the, uh, the Ron Paul side of things. But what's evolved is that we started realizing as an ecosystem that this isn't just about money. It's not just about finance. It's about the narratives that control our lives how we should vote, how we should own property, our na the narrative of privacy, the narrative of control. And what these tools allow us to do is to have some choice for the first time in human history behind those narratives, behind what controls us, behind how our lives work. And that's, that's what sustains me and keeps me in the space after being here for seven years. It's, uh, it's been a long ride, it's been a very stressful one, but to be able to be at that, that bedrock of humanity and in that discussion in the 21st century of where we need to go is really exciting. Well, you know, I started in crypto, we were like a dollar, and then we went up to $30, and then we went back down to two, and then we went from two to 256, 256 to like 40 or 80, I can't remember the floor there. And then it was 1,200, and then it was bleeding for three years down to 250. Uh, and then it went up from 20,000, and now we're down to 4,000. Um, here's the thing. These markets are thin, they're highly speculative, they're hyper volatile, everybody knows that. And either you're in it 
for solving a problem and you have a long time horizon and you love the technology and you think that these are great incentive machines to coordinate people in different ways than we've done it before, or you're in it to get rich quick. And here's the problem with getting rich quick. Every time in human history, from the 1849, you know, in California, the gold rush, the gold rush, we had Col Colorado or in the Black Hills or the oil and gas industry in the 1870s, the vast majority of people lose. It's like a casino. You can get crazy rich in a casino. You also can lose all your money, and the odds are you're, you're going to lose your money rather than getting rich. So I don't have a lot of sympathy, to be honest with you, when somebody comes in with wildly irrational expectations, they bet their life savings, even though everybody tells them not to, uh, and then they, they get involved in very volatile, controlled, highly uh, unstable markets, thinking, me too, and they don't understand the technology, they can't differentiate between things. Uh, you know, it's, it's human nature, it happens. We saw it with the dot-com boom and bust. They did a survey of people during the dot-com boom. And they went into coffee shops and other places where people were day trading, and they asked them, do you know what these companies do, where they were buying the stock? And they said, no. And they said, why did you buy the stock? They said, because I like the name. Can you imagine taking your hard-earned money that you have to go slave away for eight hours, 10 hours a day, you take years to build up these savings, and then taking all of that and just handing it to some entity you know nothing about? Yeah, and so that's the problem with our markets right now. It's predictable, it's understandable, it's very painful. I'm heavily invested in the cryptocurrency space, so I've had huge losses myself. Uh, they're, they're much larger than most people. Uh, but you get through them, and if you believe in the long time horizon, and you believe in that three to five year, maybe longer, and you're actually trying to solve real things, what you'll notice is over time you recover. It took 11 years for Amazon to recover to its post.com boom uh, uh, price, uh, from its post.com boom uh, price, and now they're one of the world's largest companies, and you know they're in drones and AI and you know web hosting. Uh, they're a very different company 11 years later, uh, but you know that. That, that tells you something about these things. So the markets are ahead of the technology, expectations are ahead of the technology, and what I do is I focus on filling that gap in and building out those protocols and getting that science done and that engineering done, and the markets will sort themselves out. So my whole point was that the, the reason these protocols exist is because you can't trust people. People are horrible, and the minute you give people wealth and power, people get worse. So in the beginning, you always have ideology and philosophy and high, uh, high vision, like look at the French Revolution. We've killed the king, huzzah, everybody's going to be friends now, we're going to create the republic. And then what's the first thing that happens? People go crazy, right? And it's the same situation in the cryptocurrency space. We all started from zero. A lot of us were poor. We, we had no power, no influence. This space tended to attract outcasts and political uh, you know, extremists, people on the outside. And then suddenly these people got crazy, crazy rich, like hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. And they got big companies and a lot of power, a lot of prestige. And instead of saying, we're going to be moral about all of this and we're going to do things the right way and things are going to be great. What are the first thing? They have these big parties with yachts and Lambos and beautiful women and all the vices that come with wealth and power started uh, accumulating in our space in excess. So in essence, what the space has done is proven the need for the products of the space which is when people get wealth and power, you have to federate or decentralize that wealth and power so that the one particular person's vices cannot destroy the entire system. We've seen this with ICO mania, we've seen this with the marketplaces, uh, we see this with the governance of a lot of these companies, especially exchanges, and you know, basically what we'll do is just keep writing protocols and uh, if we succeed, we'll be able to remove a lot of these centralized figures and centralized entities and replace them with things that don't lie, and replace them with things that are fair. Fair doesn't mean you always get to keep your money. Fair doesn't mean you're not going to have an issue. Fair means that everybody's treated the same, regardless of the consequences of that. Good tools give people a voice, an economic voice, a political voice, a religious voice, uh, some form of voice. The tragedy of the human race has been that we found ways of stabilizing society historically around taking 99% of the population and taking their voice away and giving it to 1%. That's how the world has worked, from the emperors of Rome to the emperors of Japan and China. It doesn't matter where you look. There's always this concept of the few ruling the many. And then what's happened in the 20th century and now the 21st century is this, these are the first two centuries where we've actually entertained the notion of 
everybody having some form of influence or voice or control. The first instantiation of it was through the free market, where you get to decide where to spend your money. And then in a way steers where governments go and where society goes. The next instantiation through blockchain technology is actually having dominion and control over the fictions that run society. How corporations should run, uh, you know, how property rights should work, how investments should be done. Uh, how markets should be regulated instead of these things being fixed by people you've never met, you don't know, in dark rooms in the back. They're done in, in open ways and they're done with protocols and they're done with software and if you don't like it you can choose a different system. And you can live in an economy now that can have 10 or 15 or 20 competing systems inside of it. It's kind of a funny thing, you know, when you go and live in Ukraine or America or China, you're given an assumption of how things are going to work. You're given a set of laws, a set of banks, a set of auditing, a set of accounting, a set of voting, you know, a, a national currency. You're told this is how you do business here. But now what I'm telling you is that we have an ability to live anywhere in the world and freely choose how we want to do business. And that's just as legitimate as the government-sponsored system. So that's the first time in human history where we've had that experiment. And it's really going to be interesting to see where that goes. Well, I tend not to pick on particular projects, but after Dan Larimer wrote an article saying that we plagiarized him, I consider EOS fair game, so uh, it's my, my standard kicking dog. Uh, but, uh, but basically, here's the situation. They raised $4 billion saying they have no fiduciary moral obligations to the people they take the money from. Some people are already leaving the entity to go and do different things. Furthermore, their technology, what they claim their tech could do versus what their tech actually can do, it, it, there's a huge gap between those two things. There's a recent paper that was published by an uh, affiliate of Consensus where they said transactions aren't validated, uh, it's not a Byzantine fault tolerant protocol. The performance claims that they have saying 500,000 TPS, they're getting maybe 250 or something like that. It's just wildly uh, dishonest ways of going about things. Furthermore, if you look at the governance structure, it's just 21 nodes all running on relatively the same infrastructure. And they can reverse transactions, refund money. Uh, they can arbitrarily change anything you want. And 90% of the supply is owned by 1% of the people. So your control factor is by the top 1%. You're following a traditional classic 1980s algorithm. You can't do the things you've claimed you can do. You raise $4 billion and you claim you have no moral or fiduciary obligations to the people you take the money from. What are you doing? What are you doing? And furthermore, do you need the money? Ethereum raised $18 million. It's number three cryptocurrency. It's, it's a Goliath. Bitcoin raised nothing. So, and, and, and so it just it's disgusts me at a deep, deep level, the arrogance, the, the entitlement, the attitude that the ecosystem has. And for the most part, I was willing just to let it go. But uh, after they started saying we plagiarized them and said that Ouroboros is a 400-pound bulletproof vest that doesn't stop bullets and going to the media and talking to them about it, uh, and their utter lack of regard for third-party validation of any claims or peer review, I decided that there is some prudence in pointing out that there are bad actors in this space, and I view them as one.